Article 20, About Good Works. Our teachers are falsely accused of forbidding people to do good works. But our teachers have written about the Ten Commandments and written other similar books which show that they have given people useful teachings about the various roles and positions in life. They have pointed out the deeds that are God-pleasing in the various roles and positions. In earlier times, preachers taught little about such things. They only urged people to do childish and useless deeds, such as celebrating particular holy days or certain fasts, taking part in lay societies, going on pilgrimages, having services in honor of saints, using rosaries, becoming monks, and the like. Since our opponents have been warned about these things, they are now unlearning them and are no longer preaching about these useless deeds as before. In addition, they begin to talk about faith, something they were amazingly silent about before. They teach that we are justified not by works alone, yet they join faith and works together. And they say that we are justified by faith and works. This teaching is better than the one they taught before and can give more comfort than what they used to teach. The teaching about faith, which should be the most important teaching in a church, has remained unknown for a very long time. For everyone must agree that there was the deepest silence in sermons about the righteousness of faith. Only the teaching about good works was taught in the churches. Therefore, we teach in our churches the following things about faith. First of all, that our deeds cannot reconcile us to God or earn forgiveness of sins, grace, and justification. We can only receive these by faith when we believe that we are received into favor for Christ's sake. He alone has been proclaimed as mediator and propitiation so that we can be reconciled to the Father only through him. Whoever therefore believes that he deserves grace because of his deeds despises the merit and grace of Christ and is seeking a way to God without Christ by human strength. Even though Christ has said about himself in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. This teaching about faith is discussed in many places by Paul, such as in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works. And so that no one will say that we have invented a new interpretation of Paul, we can show that this entire matter is supported by the witness of the church fathers also. For in many of his books, Augustine defends grace and the righteousness of faith against putting faith in the value of good works and also Ambrose, in his book on the calling of the Gentiles, and in other places, teaches the same thing. For in his book on the calling of the Gentiles, he says this, If justification which is brought about through grace were the result of good deeds which you have done, it would not then be the free gift of a giver, but the reward owed to the laborer. In that case, redemption by the blood of Christ would be of little value, nor would the mercy of God replace the importance of man's good works. But although this doctrine is despised by those who have not experienced it, nevertheless, godly and anxious consciences find by experience that it brings the greatest comfort, for consciences cannot find rest by doing good deeds, but only by faith when they stand on the firm ground that they have been reconciled to God because of what Christ has done. 
as Paul teaches in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. This whole doctrine must be understood as part of the struggle of the terrified conscience, nor can it be understood apart from that fight. Therefore, inexperienced and worldly people make bad judgments about this matter. They imagine that Christian righteousness is just public and philosophical righteousness. Until now, consciences have been so bothered by this teaching about good works that they could neither hear the comfort from the gospel. Some persons were were driven by their consciences into the desert or into monasteries, hoping to earn God's grace by living as monks. Some thought up other deeds by which they wished to earn grace and satisfy the punishment for sins. So there was a very great need to explain and bring to light again this teaching of faith in Christ so that anxious anxious consciences should be comforted and so that people will know that grace and forgiveness of sins and justification are received by faith in Christ. People must also learn that in this context, the term faith does not merely mean believing that certain things happened in history, the kind of faith that even the ungodly and the devil have. Rather, it means a faith that believes not only the history, but also the result of that history, namely the teaching that our sins are forgiven, that this, that we have grace righteousness and forgiveness of sins is through Christ. Now the person who knows that he has the Father who is gracious to him through Christ truly knows God. He knows also that God cares for him and he calls upon God in prayer. In short, he is not without God as the heathen are. For the devils and the ungodly are not able to believe this doctrine the forgiveness of sins. Therefore they hate God like an enemy and do not pray to him, and they expect no good from him. Augustine also instructs his readers about the word faith. He teaches that the term faith is used in the scriptures not for just knowledge, such as the ungodly have, but for confidence that comforts and encourages the terrified mind. Furthermore, we teach that it is necessary to do good works, not so that we can trust them to earn grace, but because it is the will of God. The forgiveness of sins and grace are received only by faith, and because the Holy Spirit is received by faith, hearts are renewed and given a new love so that they can produce good works. For Ambrose says, faith is the mother of a good will, and of acting rightly. For without the Holy Spirit, human powers are full of ungodly feelings, and they are too weak to do deeds that are good in God's sight. Besides, they are controlled by the devil, who moves humans to sin in a variety of ways, to hold ungodly opinions, and to carry out crimes openly. We can see this in the lives of the philosophers They tried to live good lives, but indeed did not succeed. Their many sins could be seen, showing that they remained unclean. Such is the weakness of man when he is without faith and without the Holy Spirit and uses only his strength to guide his life. So it is easy to see that this teaching cannot be accused of prohibiting good works. Rather, this teaching ought to be praised because it shows how we are enabled to truly do good works. For without faith, there is no way that human nature can do the good works demanded in the first or the second commandment. Without faith, human nature does not call upon God nor expect anything from God nor bear the cross. Instead, it seeks and trusts 
in help from other humans. And when there is no faith and trust in God, all kinds of evil desires and human ideas rule in people's hearts. As Christ said in John 15, verse 5, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And as the church sings, Without your divine favor, there is nothing found in man. Nothing in him is harmless.